person's hope and diligence in the smallest service. God sets some men on the high places of the earth and appoints them to exciting challenges, but he orders others to pitch their tents on lower ground and not be ashamed of their assignment, no matter how inferior it seems. Now, to encourage every Christian to be faithful in his particular place, God has made promises which apply to them all, and his promises are like the beams of the sun. They shine as freely through the window of the poor man's cottage as through the prince's palace. God's promises strengthen our hands and hearts against the discouragement that is most likely to weaken us in his service. They support and guard us against the furious opposition of an angry world. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and have a good courage. Joshua 1, 5 and 6. This was a promise God gave to Israel's chief magistrate, and the minister's promise agrees with it. Having generally the same trials, enemies, and discouragements, go therefore and teach all nations, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew twenty-eight nineteen and 20. The temptation which usually troubles those in lower callings is envy to see themselves on the floor and their brothers elevated to higher service. Sometimes these temptations produce dejection when the believers feel like eunuchs who bring no glory to God, dry trees which are unprofitable in his kingdom. To arm the Christian against discontent and discouragement, God promises as great a reward for faithfulness in the most menial service as he gives in more honorable service. Is anything more degrading than the role of a slave? Yet nothing less than heaven itself is promised to the faithful servant. Colossians three twenty three and 24 says, Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. God honors the poor servant's drudgery in divine service because he serves the Lord Christ. It's as if the Lord had said to him, Be not out of love with your coarse work, my child, C-O-A-R-S-E, coarse. Though your employment now is not the same as, as that of one in higher office, yet your acceptation is the same, and so shall your reward also be. Where hope is raised, the Christian cannot help but take sweet satisfaction from it. Jacob served in hope, and expected his reward from a, a better master than Laban. This made him faithful to an unfaithful man. Joseph would not wrong his master, though his mistress urged him to. He chose to suffer his unjust anger rather than accept her impure love. The evidence of this grace in a servant is better security for his faithfulness than a thousand-dollar bond. The next section, hope supports the Christian in the greatest afflictions. The hope of salvation supports the believer in the greatest afflictions. The Christian's patience is his back, where he carries his burdens. And some afflictions are so heavy that he needs a broad one to carry them. But if hope does not lay the pillow of the promise between his back and his burden, the least cross will prove too much. And therefore, this promise is called the patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1.3 Some men force themselves into a kind of quietness in their troubles because they cannot help it. They see no hope. I call this a desperate patience, and it may last for a while. But if despair were a cure for troubles, the damned could relax. Another patience very common in the world is stupid patience, which, like Nabal's mirth, lasts no longer than his drunkenness. As soon as men realize their true situation, their hearts die within them. But the patience of hope is a sober grace, which abides as long as hope lasts. When hope is healthy, it floats and even dances on the waters of affliction as a tight Sound ship sails in tempestuous seas. But when hope springs a leak, 
The waves break into the Christian's heart and he sinks until hope, with much work at the pump of the promise, clears the soul once again. This was David's case. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul, Psalm 69, 1. And notice why this trouble rose and where the waters came in. O God, thou knowest my foolishness and my sins are not hid from thee, verse 5. This man's guilt made him uncomfortable under his affliction because he saw his sin and tasted God's displeasure. But when he had humbled himself and confessed his sin, he could see the coast clear between himself and heaven. He could return to sing in the same affliction. Now I want to show you even more specifically how powerfully hope influences the Christian who is in affliction. And the next section is therefore entitled Influences of Hope on Christians in Affliction. Number one, hope calms the Christian under affliction. A hopeless soul cries out in anxiety, but hope keeps the king's peace in the heart. Hopelessness cannot rest very long because hope is not there to rock it to sleep. But hope stills a disturbed spirit when nothing else can, as the mother quietens her crying baby by laying it to the breast. When David's soul was uneasy because of affliction, he laid his soul to the breast of the promise, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. That's Psalm 43, 5. And his soul sleeps as peacefully as a nourished child. Moses' spirit was grieved when Aaron and Miriam vented their anger toward him in foul language. But he kept his peace and waited for God to prove his innocence. And no doubt, his patience made God even more annoyed to see such a meek man wronged for his sake. And thus he moved quickly to wipe off the dirt they had thrown in his face before it could soak into the prejudice of his good name in the thoughts of others. Waiting on God for deliverance during affliction is closely linked with holy silence. Truly, Psalm 62, 1, my soul waiteth upon God, and from him cometh my salvation. The Hebrew literally reads, my soul is silent. Number two, hope fills the afflicted soul with joy. Hope brings such consolation that the afflicted soul can smile even when tears run down the face. This is called the rejoicing of the hope in Hebrews 3.6. And hope never produces more joy than in affliction. The sun paints the beautiful colors in the rainbow on a watery cloud. Rejoice in hope of the glory of God, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Glorying is a rejoicing which the Christian cannot contain within himself. It comes forth in some outward expression to let others know what a feast he has inside. The springs of comfort lie high indeed when joy flows from the believer's mouth, and all the joy which sustains the suffering saint is sent in by hope at the cost of Christ who has prepared unspeakable glory in heaven. Should we pity ourselves for the tribulations we go through on the way to Christ's glory? While troubles attack with oppression, the gracious promises anoint with blessings. Hope breaks the alabaster box of the promises over the Christian's head and sends consolations abroad in the soul. And like a precious ointment, these comforts exhilarate and refresh the spirit heal the wounds, and remove the pain. Paul says, Hope makes not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Romans 5.5 5. Faith and hope are two graces which Christ uses above all others to fill the soul with joy, because these fetch all their wine of joy out of doors. Faith tells the soul what Christ has done. Hope revives the soul with news of what he will do. But both draw sweet wine from the same source, which is Christ and his promise. Other fountains of comfort tell the Christian how much he has suffered for Christ rather than what he has done for him. 
what Christ has done for him. But it is neither pleasing to Christ nor safe for the saint to drink his joy from this vessel. Would the servant wear the king's crown? Why cry Hosanna to Christ's grace in us when it is there only by God's mercy? Praise belongs to the one from whom we have our joy. And so we are to rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. It is deceptive for us to have confidence in the flesh because of the instability of our hearts and the inconsistent behavior of our virtues, which ebb as often as they flow. Our human joy cannot be constant because our graces are not. As these natural springs are high or low, so their level would rise or fall. We would inevitably drink more water than wine. We would lack joy more often than have it. But the Christian's cup need never be empty because he draws his wine from an undrainable fountain which never sends any soul away ashamed as the brook of our inherent grace would certainly do sooner or later. Number three, hope exhilarates the afflicted spirit. Three ingredients of hope make this possible. First, hope's news of a happy issue heals the wounds of present suffering. Sometimes when God comes to save his afflicted servants, he surprises them before they look for him. I know the thoughts that I think of you, Jeremiah 29, 11, that thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Hope is a prying grace. It can look beyond God's outward acts. With the help of the promise, it is able to see into the very heart of God and read what purposes are written there concerning the Christian's particular circumstances. And it relays this message, encouraging him not to be troubled to hear God speaking roughly, in the language of his providence, hope assures he intends your blessing, no matter how it appears otherwise. For as the law, which came hundreds of years after the promise to Abraham, could not annul it, neither can any intervening afflictions destroy those thoughts of love which for so long have been in his heart for your deliverance and salvation. In a storm, the traveler can stand patiently under a tree while it rains because he hopes it's only a shower. And he can see it clearing up in one part of the heavens while it's still dark in another. Providence is never too cloudy for hope to see fair weather coming from the promise. Luke twenty-one twenty-eight. when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. When the Christian's affairs are most disconsolate, he may soon meet with a happy change, for the joy of that blessed day will come in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we shall be changed. One moment we are dressed in rags of mortal flesh, but in the twinkling of an eye we are arrayed with robes of immortality, embossed with a thousand times more glory than the sun's garment of light. It is but winking, said a martyr to his fellow suffer in the fire, and our pain and sorrow will be over. Hope is an ointment which heals from a distance. The saint's hope is laid up in heaven, and yet it heals all the wounds they receive on earth. But this is not all. As hope prophesies concerning the happy end of the Christian's afflictions, so it assures him he will be cared for while he endures them. If Christ sends his disciples to see, he will be with them when they need him most. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, Isaiah 43, 2. Hope is God's messenger that speaks to the person who has concluded he will never be able to outlive such a rough tide of affliction. Hope lifts his head above the surging waves and says, Go, for your God will be with you. Is not Christ your husband? He can tell you how to suffer, for he was brought up in suffering from the cradle to the cross. Behold, he even comes out to meet you. Glad to see your face and ready to impart some of his suffering skill to you. Because hope heals the heart, suffering is a harmless thing and not to be dreaded. And then next, hope assures the Christian that present sufferings bear no comparison 
to the coming joy of salvation. This assurance kept early Christians from despairing while the enemy spilled their blood. The scent of this hope revived their spirits, 2 Corinthians 4.16, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Is it not strange that their courage grew while they lost their blood? They welcomed the strong wine of hope. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The man who buys the world's glittering hope at the expense of his conscience has paid too high a price. But we gain heaven cheaply, even if we lose all our carnal interests, even life itself. Who will grudge to give up the lease on a low-rent farm, which will expire in a few days, for such is our temporal life, for an eternal inheritance of the saints in light? This hope has made God's faithful servants carry their lives in their hands, willing to lay them down, while they look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 2 Corinthians 4.18 Next, hope teaches the necessity of suffering as we press on to salvation. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Luke 24, 26. It's as if Christ had said, Why do you mourn for your master's death as if all your hopes were smashed? Was there any other way he could get home and and take possession of his glory that awaited him in heaven? Truly, the saint's way to salvation lies along the same road which Christ walked. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together, Romans 8, 17. But this path would be impossible for us to tread if Christ had not gone before us to make the way. If we understand that afflictions are as necessary to carry us to glory as waters are to take a ship to port, we can reconcile ourselves to them and delight to travel that way. Some philosophers say that God is blessing us when we live in the sunshine of prosperity and cursing us when our condition is overcast with adversity. But hope can see heaven on a cloudy day. It can expect good out of evil. The Jews open their windows when it thunders and lightnings, expecting that Messiah is going to come. I'm sure hope opens her window widest in a day of stormy tempest. Zephaniah 3.12, I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. Therefore I will look up unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me, Micah 7.7. 7. God does not take up the acts of his sovereignty into his hand to make chips. When he has pruned severely and driven his acts the deepest, his people may expect some beautiful piece of work when all is finished. Well, it's sweet to meditate on Romans 8.28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. If you should get up some morning and hear men on your house tearing off the tiles and taking down the roof with hammers and axes, you might think a gang of vicious enemies had come to destroy your home. But As soon as you understand that these workmen have been sent by your father to mend your house, you gladly endure the noise and trouble. Indeed, you thank your father for his care and expense. The very hope of the advantage that will come from the repairs makes you willing to dwell a while in the inconvenient rubble of the old house. The promise assures the believer that the heavenly father intends no harm, only good, as he rebuilds the ruined frame of your soul into a glorious temple, and afflictions have a hand in the work. This insight frees you to pray, Lord, cut and shape me however you will, that at last I may be framed according to the pattern which your love has drawn for me. Some ignorant men fear the fuller's soap might spoil their clothing, but one who understands what refining means will not be afraid. Amen.